Today we're gonna talk about probably my favorite piece of history and one of the most significant political events in Caribbean history. If you watch my other videos or you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen me using this flag. But do you know what it means? When I was asked that question a couple years ago, I definitely didn't. What was then explained to me was a story of optimism and heartbreak, of a great effort towards regional unity and of how it never truly came to pass. This is a story of the West Indies Federation, to dwell together in unity. The struggle towards Caribbean unity didn't start in 1958 with the Federation, nor did it start in the 1930s when workers united with the common goal of dismantling the political system of worker exploitation. The real foundation for the sentiments that would develop into our West Indianness can be traced back to the long period of slave rebellion. Throughout the region, from Bookman and Toussaint in Haiti to Kojo in Guyana, the oppressed voices said no in unison to European subjugation. After emancipation, these reformist ideas began to evolve. A long line of intellectual and political leaders emerged to give voice to the underlying discontent in the Caribbean region towards Crown colony rule. Mainly composed of the descendants of African slaves and indentured Indians, the British West Indies saw federation as the bridge between colonialism and independence to finally remove the yoke of white supremacy from their necks. T.A. Marichaud, often heralded as the father of the federation, dedicated his life through journalism and political activism to the abolishment of Crown Colony government in the Caribbean. But he wasn't the only one. Captain Cipriani of Trinidad and Raul of Dominica and Krishlo of British Guyana and Grantley Adams of Barbados and Bradshaw of St. Kitts were all other Caribbean leaders fighting for freedom. As early regionalists, they were united in the understanding that if they were to seriously attempt to free themselves from colonial rule in their individual islands, they would have to struggle together. The first regional meeting initiated by leaders of the Caribbean to discuss the future of the region was held in Dominica in 1932. Rawlins, the chair of said meeting, said in his final address, We suggest that there should be a governor general of the whole of the West Indies, who in the exercise of the powers and authorities entrusted to him, must act upon the advice of the Federal Executive Council. The Federal Assembly will from its own membership select for the governor his advisors. The most radical change of all, perhaps, is the proposal that the governor general and in similar manner the officers administering the island governments shall not have the power to disregard the advice of their executive councils. In Canada, Newfoundland, New Zealand, and even Little Malta, the officers administering the government act upon the advice of their executive councils. Why should the people of the West Indies continue to be burdened with executives irresponsible to the legislature? At the same time as these dreams were forming, Britain's fears were growing. The threat that the British West Indies could fall to revolution had become a pressing reality, a reality that the British and their American allies wished to avoid at all costs. Thus, against the backdrop of growing Caribbean nationalism and Britain's need to free themselves from the responsibility of their territories, the West Indian Federation was born. The Federation was an internally self-governing federal state made up of 10 territories, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Jamaica, Montserrat, the then St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad and Tobago. The goal of the Federation was to create a political unit that would become independent from Britain as its own state, similar at the time to the Canadian Federation and the Australian Commonwealth. During its brief existence from 1958 to 1962, the Federation sought to improve the sectors of agriculture, civil aviation, education, fisheries, forestry, livestock, maritime services, marketing, medicine, postal services, and telecommunications. It moved to establish various federal institutions and supporting structures. It first created a federal civil service, established the West Indies Shipping Service to operate two multi-purpose ships to make trade easier both within the region and internationally. Each island didn't need to build up their own shipping infrastructure and instead work together to ship more efficiently. Also, education at the tertiary level was expanded during this period. The West Indian Meteorological Service was established. The then University College of the West Indies, which had a campus in Mona, Jamaica, opened a second campus in Trinidad and became the University of the West Indies. But even quicker than it began, the Federation dissolved in just four years. 
From the start, it was riddled with issues. These included the governance and administrative structures imposed by the British. The new rules made it so that the Federation's powers were actually very weak. Britain still held sweeping veto power, and the Premier of the Federation held even less power than the heads of individual members. This proved to be detrimental come election time, when neither Eric Williams nor Norman Manley wanted to give up the power in their individual territories in order to head this new venture in dire need of leadership. This move spelled the beginning of the end. Conflicting island-specific interests led to constant clashes. They fought about where the capital would be. The more developed islands of Jamaica and Trinidad felt that the small islanders would come into their countries and take all their jobs, which led to a lack of free movement between the islands. In the same vein, Trinidad with its oil and Jamaica with their bauxite and budding tourism industry felt like to support the other islands would hinder their own development. Most federations suffer from the imbalance of power in their component parts, but in no other has the distribution been so lopsided and has led to such detrimental results as in the West Indies. Jamaica and Trinidad made up 7 eighths of the population and 3 quarters of the wealth and felt that they should grant them elevated status in the federation. CLR James, noted Caribbean historian, wrote, Devoid of program and consideration for the people, they saw federation and met among themselves only to arrange what their governments would get and what they would lose. This is always an important part of any political discussion, but if you are discussing nothing else, then the result is always the violent quarrels by which these gentlemen broke up the federation and disgraced the West Indian people. I think another big issue was the failure by those in leadership positions to convey the importance of the federation to the average West Indian. To this day, we still don't seem to get why Caribbean unity is important. This was back in a time before the relatively short distance between the islands was made even shorter with technology. This made communication between the different stakeholders very difficult, and if someone is doing business on your behalf and there is no communication, distrust is sure to form. Jamaica in particular, being the furthest away from the cluster, had a certain detachment to the group and saw their Caribbean brethren more as dependent second cousins. With the election of Barbados's Grantley Adams as premier, an even greater rift formed, when from a Jamaican perspective, it seemed like the suspicion that these people from a world away were going to just come and dictate policy to Jamaica seemed to be confirmed. The results were in, and Jamaicans had voted in a referendum to leave the Federation. In that moment, the hopes and dreams of millions and over a decade of work disappeared. Following this, on 14th January 1962, Eric Williams decreed the now infamous phrase, one from ten leaves not, and Trinidad was out too. The Federation continued its slow painful death with the formation of the Little Eight, but that soon fell through too, with Barbados reluctant to bear the burden of the other islands. Antigua and Grenada floated the idea of merging with Jamaica and Trinidad respectively, but even that didn't work out. The West Indies Federation was legally dissolved on 31st May 1962. The remaining Little Eight territories once again became colonies directly supervised by Britain. While the Caribbean Federation didn't last, its efforts were not in vain. It paved the way for many of our modern institutions for Caribbean integration. Things like CARICOM and the CSME, uh, CXC and the Caribbean Development Bank were all birthed out of Federation era organizing. But I think in this day and age we can gain more than just a story of a failed initiative. The optimism and hope for unity that the Federation represented is something we should cling to. Because the division today is still deep. Every couple months there's some beef in Caribbean Twitter. The division of big and small islands still exists with new ways that we've found to divide the region into us versus them. I've been lucky enough to travel to a few of the Caribbean islands and to interact with others when they visit Dominica. And all I see is how similar we are how our shared history really has created one people. So in making these videos, I hope I can continue the mission of T.A. Mari Show to educate, agitate, and maybe someday, federate. Rally, rally from the West Indies. Obviously, the West Indies Federation is a big topic and this is just a surface overview. I could make a few more videos on it. So if you all want a more in-depth video or a series of videos, let me know in the comments. If there are enough comments, I'll make one. Um, if you like this video in general, share it, subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, follow me on Instagram too. Uh, thanks for watching.